Namaste. Before watching this episode, please hit the subscribe button and be sure to share with your friends. My guest today is Rakesh Kaul, an author, historian, cultural ambassador of Kashmir. His recent book, The Last Queen of Kashmir, is making waves. It, there was an event locally here in Princeton. I wasn't able to attend, my wife did, and as a result, she spent many, many days reading his book, uh, reading out excerpts for me. Uh, uh, she couldn't be here, Indrani, but we will have other occasions to host uh, Rakesh and discuss more about his amazing stories about Kashmir. Welcome, Rakesh. Thank you for having me, Rajiv, and really grateful to Indrani for her sponsoring me here. Uh, she's actually a great ambassador of your work because she's really loves this book. And uh, if she were here, she would be holding it up and saying, you know, um, everybody should read this book. So uh, we're going to have an interesting discussion. Uh, I am going to pick Rakesh's brain because he's done so much work on it, on uh, the history, background of Kashmir, uh, then talk about this particular queen on whose story the whole uh, book is based. And then we'll talk about current issues, current affairs and so on. But let me first tell you a little bit about uh, Rakesh. Rakesh has a similar background to me. He, he came in to the US in 72, I was here in 71. Uh, he pursued, uh, he, he has a tech background as, as I do. Uh, he pursued a corporate career very successfully. And then for the last uh, 15 or more years has been involved in uh, the pursuit of knowledge about his culture. Kashmiri, is that fair? That's a very good summary, yes. yes. And one of the, before we go into the subject matter, uh, a major accomplishment is that he, because of his intervention, the German Chancellor personally returned a very important Durga Murti, a very historical piece to Prime Minister Modi in 2015? Yes, that's correct. So the picture you're seeing is the Chancellor handing it over to Prime Minister Modi. And uh, tell us a little bit about what happened. I mean, not in too much detail because that's a long story, I, I guess. Yes. But what happened? So uh, I had uh, a dinner meeting with Dr. Pal Pratapaditya, one of India's great art historians. And he told me, Sir Rakesh, I want to tell you the story of the Tengapura Durga, but the sad thing is you can do nothing about it. And that was the beginning of the journey where I took a sacred oath that I would recover this Durga, which is the oldest continuously worshipped Durga in the Indian subcontinent that was stolen by a chain of zealots, smugglers, criminals brought out from Kashmir to New York to Germany. And it took me many years, but I was relentless. I was not to be denied. And then in partnership, a very successful partnership with the Archaeological Survey of India, with the Indian ambassador in Germany, with other wonderful friends, we got it back. It's the first time that a foreign government returned uh, antiquity back to India because of the pressure that was brought on it by an individual and the government of India working together. Fantastic. So that's a, 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 a mystery tale uh, uh, with all intrigue and so on. Uh, we'll have to have a special session on how you went about doing this. I will gladly do that because your viewers will be inspired by it and we have so many treasures all over the world which now I have traveled to and you have traveled to and seen and those all have to come back home. They have to come back home. So let's uh, move on to the Kashmir story which, sure. is, which is very exciting. Yeah. Uh, before we talk about the book, I think it will help our viewers who may not be historians of this uh, topic to tell them a little bit about, uh, give a kind of a grand sweep of history of Kashmir. Mm -hmm. Tell us. Kashmir has the oldest continuous written history of humanity in it, going back 
over 5,000 years. And this book is the first book that studies that inflection point that occurred in early 14th century, which should be of interest to military officers, to media, to government, all over the world. So, but starting back in earlier times, yes. Uh, tell us about uh, the philosophy, the spiritual traditions, because you know, Shaivism has its origins there. Absolutely. Uh, it is the home of Shiva. This is uh, Buddhism has a lot. Uh, Absolutely. Buddhism's export to uh, the northern places. Yes. Uh, you know, Japan. I mean, uh, uh, certainly uh, Tibet. Uh, in in that. Uh, Kashmir has a lot to do with it Absolutely. and part of the Silk Route. Yeah, so absolutely. it's it's got a grand history before the arrival of the Muslims. So the pre-Islamic Kashmir needs to be understood. So tell us a little bit about it. So Kashmir started, the history of Kashmir starts really over 5,000 years ago when in the Mahabharata you hear this encounter with Balram coming and reporting that the Saraswat River was dry. And the Saraswat Brahmins, a group of them, migrated to Kashmir. There is a very poignant moment where they come to King Neela and one of the Brahmins says, tell us, how can we migrate and live permanently in Kashmir Valley? That's the first immigration contract that we have in history. And we'll talk more about the agreement that was reached between the Nagas and the Kashmiri Saraswat uh, uh, Brahmins at that time, and uh, a contract that we honor to this day. We can talk about that story later. But once they entered Kashmir, what a grand civilization was created. Your viewers will be astounded to know that whatever aspect of life Kashmir touched on it. When you talk about literature, the word Sahitya came from Kashmir. When you talk about Yoga Sutra, Patanjali the Kashmirian wrote about it. Sanskrit grammar, Panini. When you look at Charaka for medicine, when you look at the number zero, the first record of the number zero is the Bakshali manuscript, which was found in that area of Kashmir. When you look at the great theory of aesthetics, which is nowhere to be found in the world, Rasa, over a thousand years that was developed in Kashmir. When you look at the technology of story writing, Panchtantra, 200 BC, followed by Kathasarit Sagar. I can just keep going on. But this was a civilization that was founded on the principles of Shiva, which is freedom. I am sovereign. I am free. It's a civilization which was founded when Yogvashisht, a text of Kashmir, Vashisht tells Ram, O oh Ram, if the gods are on one side and they tell you one thing, and truth is on the other side and you know the truth. Then Ram ignore the gods, but follow truth. This was a civilization that was not a blind believer of any religion. It was a truth seeking framework. And that extraordinary framework created Shaivism. It created, very few people know this, Buddha gave us wisdom. It was Kashmir that injected compassion in Buddhism. It is Kashmir that sent more scholars and thinkers and wise people to China, to Korea, to Japan than all of India put together. They went to Kyrgyzstan, they went to Kazakhstan and they carried the message. It was, in the opinion of most people, the one spot on the globe that had greater impact on the known world than any other place. In fact, you can think of Kashmir Valley pre-14th century as having the same impact that Silicon Valley is having today. Important. So as an export hub for Indian civilization to other parts of Asia, That's Kashmir correct. as a major export hub. Because of its location on the Silk Route, land yes. route, that yes. may be one reason? That's <clears throat> true. And But most importantly, it was a magnet civilization. It was a magnet civilization where people came from 
all over the world. In fact, I have written a scholarly article where I have traced that in the Temple of Solomon, the incense that was burned, the key ingredient, costus, came from Kashmir. Well, that's something very interesting I'll share with my Jewish friends. Yes. Uh, th th this is an important point. Uh, it's very interesting that Al Biruni, whose history is studied yes. in India, and he mentions with some degree of envy and anger because he was denied admission into Kashmir. <clears throat> he said, Kashmir is a very special land where meritorious people are allowed to get in, including Jewish people. <laughs> because in their eyes, Jews were not good. But yeah. in India, of course, everybody is allowed. Yeah. So Jewish people were allowed into Kashmir. And uh, so it was a uh, land where there were Jains, there were Parsis, uh, every faith was there, every Pantha was there. Mm. Now this is a, an amazing place for a very long period of time, mm -hmm. uh, 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 a treasure trove of uh, human history. Mm -hmm. uh, but around the 40, 14th century, thereabouts, yeah. things suddenly changed because of the arrival of Islam. In a, in a radical way or in a dramatic way. Mm -hmm. So tell us, how did Islam come? Who brought it and what happened then? So I'm glad you mentioned uh, in a radical way because the entry of Islam into Kashmir actually predates the 14th century by almost 500 years. The first Muslim who arrived into Kashmir was actually an attendant of the Prince of Sindh. When Sindh was sacked, the prince escaped and gained sanctuary in Kashmir. Mm. So one of his attendants was a follower of the Islamic faith. So Islam was in Kashmir for close to 500 years maybe, very peaceful, coexisting with the local population. Uh, in fact, there's some slight evidence that uh, the uh, local Kashmiris used to call the Quran as the Mausala Veda it, in their effort to incorporate it. And there is also some slight evidence that they created something called the Turuksha Bharava. So this was all sort of, you know, uh, accommodating the influx of this. And so everything was very peaceful. But these Muslims who were there uh, were individuals, they were individuals. not rulers. Yeah. So they, there, was, there was no king, governor, mil no, military no, type no, thing. No, no, no. It was just private citizens. Private citizens seeking sanctuary and very willing to enter this new land and uh, fit into it. Mm. But early 14th century, something changed. And what changed was that you had once again a resurgence of violent jihadic Islam. Was and it from within or outsiders? The first thing that happened was that within Iran, the Musafirid dynasty was trying to take control and there was total upheaval there. And so many Muslims came to Kashmir to seek sanctuary. And there was a very weak King Sudev. He was very liberal. In fact, the historian of the time period writes that they came like bees because they, they knew the king was a pleasure tree. The very mm -hmm. interesting poetic language right. that he writes. And he let this guy Shahmir in, he let this guy Rinchana from Ladakh in, he let the Chuck people in, very liberal guy. And they came and they settled into the valley and they were given villages, they were given grants, they uh, were really treated very nicely. But the first thing that happened was there was a savage attack on Kashmir led by a of a person whose story is mentioned, Dulacha. And Dulacha had put together an army of Persians, Turkic people, some Tajik people, and they came. And it was horrific what they did. Uh, the historian says that 
they were like locusts. They did not leave a blade of grass. They captured when they had to leave the valley because of winter, and they took the youth of the society. Slaves. Slaves. They put holes through their collarbone, and then leather straps were put in, and then these people were made to walk in line. I don't want to go beyond that because it is so horrific, but the historian records that. That was the attack that was launched on the valley. And then, unfortunately, as the story unfolds, the people who were given sanctuary, internally, they turned into fifth columnists. They became treacherous to the state that had given them sanctuary. Common people, Muslims come, live in peace for a long time. They are respectful of the local Hindus. Hindus are respectful of them. But then when Muslim ruler comes, these common friendly people also turn into violent, vicious people. Yes. This has happened in many places. Happened in many places. My parents had to run from Lahore yes. at the time of partition. Yes. And, real, and told, tell us stories where neighbors who were Muslims were very dear friends, yes. staff, drivers, colleagues, who had, who had no problem with them. Yes. Once it was announced that Lahore is under Islamic rule, yes. it belongs to Pakistan, yes. even people who had no problem with you suddenly turned. Yes. This is a very strange uh, kind of psychology of uh, Muslims that when they feel that their authority is not in control politically, militarily, they are one way. But when they feel that their, their Muslim head or Muslim senior person, has, authoritative person has come and taken over, then all of a sudden they want to take over. So this sword is the sword of the invaders, one yes. of the invaders sitting yes. in the museum. Yes. And the next one, which is a crown, is the royal family of Kashmir's crown. Yes. Where is it sitting now? It's now sitting in the Metropolitan Museum. In New York. In New York, which just shows when a civilization is shattered, how far its pieces, pieces get can be far, far flung yes. all over the place. Yes. yes. Very sad. So now, now this is the setting for Kota Rani, what That's you just correct. described. That's correct. Is that the context where we can introduce Kota Rani? Yes, but I just want to make one additional point, sure. which is not well understood, and that is how fierce the Kashmiri warriors used to be until then. Okay. Kashmir was not conquered by outside forces. Even with Dulacha, yes, he came, he raided, but eventually he had to leave, and Kashmir rebuilt itself. So, it's also not known that the biggest war manual in the world was written Kashmir in the 11th century. This was a civilization that was not just about scholarly learning. That was not just about the good life. These were fierce warriors that were respected. They were never conquered from outside. They fell from within. So how did it happen from within? Tell us. Kota Rani, early 14th century, Hindu queen, Hindu princess, inherits the throne in very troubled circumstances. And the first act of treachery that happens is that Rinchana, a Buddhist who was given sanctuary, kills the king kills her father, who is the military general of Kashmir, through subterfuge, takes her prisoner, and takes the kingdom, and converts to Islam. So a Buddhist convert to Islam yes. is the person who does the subterfuge. So he's an insider because he's originally a Buddhist. Yes. He's, he converts to Islam and does all this. That's right. Now, do we know a lot about how and why he converted and what was going on and was it some kind of a inducement or what was it? Do we know enough? Yeah, I think we have a very <coughs> clear idea that he realized that he had succeeded beyond his wildest imagination. 
It was a set of circumstances. Suddenly he finds himself in the throne. But he knew that he really did not have any popular support. The only people that he could count on were the other immigrants, many of them Muslims. We know that a prior king of Kashmir, a very controversial king of Kashmir, by the name of Harsha, he had brought Muslim mercenaries who were armed to support his rule. And so Rinchana wanted those people to be on his side. So that's the uh, early era equivalent of Muslim vote bank. I, I, you know, it never hit me, but yes. That's what it is. Yeah, I but mean, today, instead of a vote bank, it they was were, the they were physical warriors. Yeah. So, you know, you want to be king and uh, you convert, you uh, bring these guys yeah. in and yeah. make a deal and they are yeah. there to fight for you. Yeah. Now, there's a story that he wanted to become Hindu and he was not accepted. I deal with that in the, in the, in the book. Uh, there's also a story that his so-called conversion to Islam was a fake conversion only designed to get the support. Look, all those are stories. I deal with the book. But the net result was he ended up becoming the first Muslim ruler of Kashmir. Problem is, he lasted only three years. But he had opened the door. And that was the beginning of that. So now tell us about Kota Rani. So Kota Rani is a extraordinary woman and it's very interesting first that nobody knows about her and let me can I tell you how I stumbled yeah, yeah tell us tell us my wife Sushma her last name is Dhar and I wanted to research the origin of her name uh, where do the Dhars come from what's their history and I stumbled on this person, Birbal Dhar. Mm. And this was in the time of Maharaja Ranjit Singh when the Afghans were ruling Kashmir. They were really horrifically bad people. So many Hindus and Muslims came to Birbal Dhar, who was a prominent aristocrat, and said, please do something. So he said, okay. And he and his son, went through the mountain pass, he left his wife and his daughter with the milkman. They were hiding there. Mm. So he goes to Ranjit Singh and says, please come and rescue us. Now Ranjit Singh was a wily old fox. He listened to everything. He said, let me think about it. And he waited for a year. Meanwhile, the Afghan governor, Azam Khan, went wild. He knew Birbal had gone somewhere and he said, find his family, find his wife, find his daughter-in-law. They couldn't find him. But eventually it was Birbal Dhar's own relative, Tilak Chand Munshi, who committed an act of treachery. Treachery, treachery, treachery. Releases the information on the location. The governor sends his people. They grabbed the two women. The daughter-in-law was shipped as a slave to the harem of Afghanistan and Iran. The mother-in-law managed to swallow poison. And her last words were, there will always be a Kota Rani. Remember me to my husband. Now I read this and I said, I know Kashmir's history very well. Who is this Kota Rani? I research everything. There is nothing about Kota Rani. But why did this woman in 1800, 1750, 1800, her last word, why did she invoke this symbol which, of resistance? Which year? 1750 or so. So a few centuries after Kota Rani. Yeah, few centuries after Kota Rani. So I said, why during the time of Ranjit Singh? Who was this Kota Rani? Why would this woman invoke Kota Rani? There will always be a Kota Rani, a symbol of woman resistance. That started my journey. It took me seven years to collect materials from India, from Persia, from England, from Germany. And my eyes were opened. And then I also understood 
why she had been buried. And I'm happy to answer that question. Okay, so why was she buried? So she was buried because when you study the transitions that occurred, and Hindu rule was overthrown, you always have the familiar stories. Oh, the king was a lecher. The king was corrupt. The lower castes were suffering, right? The familiar... Uh, Western Indology full of all this. Right. Justifying the invasions, justifying the atrocities, because it's the fault of the Indian people themselves, they deserved it. Right. Now, this case of Kota Rani presented a very peculiar problem. The peculiar problem it presented, because look, these people had come in, they were desperately trying to legitimize their rule, so you know, they had to put out a story, their historians had to put out a story, but the problem was this. Kota Rani was not corrupt. She was a woman, she was not lecherous, didn't have a harem. And the problem was that the king before her, very consistent with Kashmir's history, was from the lower caste. So Kashmir did not have this so-called caste issue. There were different castes, but social mobility was free-flowing. So what to come up with? Now they had a similar problem in Ladakh. When they came and they killed the local king and they married the daughter, there they took the argument, oh, that king was a cannibal. He used to steal babies and eat them. But in Kashmir, where people who were intelligent kept records and it was not an obscure located society, you couldn't get away with that argument. So what to do? There was no option but to completely bury her. So the invader has to either badmouth and, uh, you know, kind of demonize the people that uh, they invaded yes. to make it to justify what he's doing, which is how Islam's invasion is uh, an entry into India is justified by the left today yes. also. Yes. That they came to liberate people because they were more freedom loving and India had problems and whatnot. Yes. So either you could do that or if you cannot do that as in the case of Kota Rani because the evidence is so compellingly against uh, such a theory, yes. then you just try to bury her. Yes. So you just, you just washed, washed out of history. Yeah. But here is the positive aspect of Kota Rani. <clears throat> if you are a viewer, young viewer, let's say anywhere from 15 to 35, and if you're a woman especially, one of the things you probably face is a real shortage of flesh and blood women role models, right? I mean, Sita, Draupadi, they are sort of iconic women, but you don't think that they may have relevance to the problems you face in life, right? Kota Rani is the kind of girl that any woman and any man would want to learn about. She was clearly beautiful. She was as beautiful, or certainly more beautiful than Cleopatra. She managed an empire that was as big as the one that Queen Elizabeth did. She was a warrior, hand-to-hand -hand combat, she was compassionate. She dealt with all of the questions that we face today. Who to love? If you're gonna marry somebody of a different religion, do you convert or you don't convert? How do you protect your children? How do you preserve the society which has a tolerant, inclusive ethos in the face of an ideology that prescribes violence and force and exclusivity. So these burning questions that face us today were the questions that she was facing. And until her very end, she managed her way and navigated her way beautifully. And through all of it, she did not deviate from dharma. Would you say she was how would you compare her with, say, feminists today 
who would consider Western people, Western women who were sort of like that, they would uh, champion them as feminists. How would you position her in that discussion? Unlike the Western model of equality, which is what feminism is in America and the West, unlike the Eastern model of feminism, yin-yang, you know, women and men are two halves of a whole, Kashmir had a very different model of feminism. I call that fearless symmetry. The Shiva Shakti model was a model where there was dynamic interplay between Shiva and Shakti. But if Shiva was latent, then Shakti was fully empowered. A woman was fully empowered. What that meant in real life was this, that Kashmir had more sovereign queens that ruled the kingdom as rulers than any other place on earth. Consort queens had equal power. Typically, they served as the minister of finance. And it is striking what happened to women after that civilization came to an end. Now, let me talk about Kota Rani. Kota Rani, as a woman, was remarkably open-minded. Remarkably open-minded. She did what she describes in the novel. She says, I will do what I desire, what I know about, and what is within my grasp. She had sovereign authority on herself. And as an icon of feminism, she's actually, in many ways, stronger than her husband, Udyan Dev. In fact, historians have said he was a weak man, but I don't think he was a weak man. It's just that Kota Rani was so strong. She was much smarter than the jihadis who invaded. She killed Achala. So tell us about that. Tell us her life story. Just quickly, the political dynamics that happened during her life. Uh, why before and after became different with her as the fulcrum? So there are several high points about her story. Uh, you know, for example, Kashmir suffers periodically from floods, right? Most Kashmiris don't know that she built the first ca canal bypass. It's called Kot Kol, Kot after Kota, Kol meaning a canal. It exists to this day, but Kashmiris do have no clue who was this woman, extraordinary woman who had the brains that, hey, this valley gets flooded periodically, let us create a bypass canal. She was the first one to do that. Now, there are many high points in her life, uh, how she faced a famine that hit the valley and how she saved her people. She, her shining moment, though, comes when Achala, uh, uh, who followed Dulacha as an attacker, put an army, comes. That's the Muslim invader. Yeah, yeah. And the next one, he comes. It's just fascinating how the historians describe her husband supposedly abandons her and runs away to Kishtwar. Total panic in the kingdom because the king has run away, the army is in tatters. So she sends a message to Achala. She says, look, if you come and attack the kingdom like Dulacha did, you'll get nothing. People will run away, you will get nothing. Come marry me. My husband has run away. Come marry me and don't go back. Come and sit here and let's rule the kingdom together. So this foolish man, tempted by her beauty and tempted that the kingdom would be his and the pleasures of Kashmir would be his, agrees to her condition, which is why bring your whole army, just come with a smaller group of people and we'll consummate the marriage and then you rule. Well, the moment he comes with a small group, she comes and she kills him. So then how did she meet her end? So how she meets her end is very sad, which is that... We have a picture of the place where this happened. This happened, yeah. How, this, how she meets is one of the 
immigrants who had come in from Swat area, Shamir, and who had been given extraordinary privileges, so much so that he had risen from an immigrant and become a minister in the government. He then got the title of commander-in-chief. I mean, can you imagine any place in the world providing that kind of support? At the end, he turned into a traitor. And he brought massive amounts of people from Iran, a demographic invasion of so-called Sufis. This term Sufi, which has been repositioned as harbingers of peace, Kashmir's history is not at all that. Yeah, okay. I, in fact, am going to do an episode on this. This, this, this whole Sufi business, the Sufis have done some of the most atrocious things. Yes. Yeah. So they come and he essentially, there is civil war. He comes and through some acts of treachery, he defeats Kota, takes a prisoner, now, whether she committed suicide or whether he killed her after one night, one can talk about, but that was that. And Shamir turns out to be the iconic traitor to his savior. This uh, image is the place where she was meditating. Now, of course, it's reconstructed, but yes. what was existing at that time yeah. was a temple where she was meditating. Yes. And she comes out of this and kills it. Yeah, this in is the, the story, it was a sacred Tirtha. Of course, now it's all been redone. Uh, but it was an ancient sacred Tirtha. And that's where in the story she invokes the strategy and the energy uh, goddess Durga to be able to go and commit this act. So I think it's very important to understand what happened to Kashmir. And I have put here a few points for the consideration of the viewers. Over the long arc of history, a civilization that had an open mind ended up with a completely closed mind. And that's the greatest tragedy of Kashmir. So how did this manifest itself? Kashmir was the place where the term Jeevan Mukti was coined, meaning that you can have complete fulfillment in life plus liberation, spiritual liberation. Ultimate be all you can be, the strongest pro-life, message. Today we have a value system that extols death, that says life isn't worth living, the greatest rewards are when you die. Total antithesis of what Kashmir is. Kashmir went from a progressive civilization to a regressive civilization. Kashmir was always about seekers, always about looking for the truth. And now it went to a state where you had blind belief, you had a closed mind. Innovation, in fact, is considered as heresy. It was a civilization of contemplation, of introspection, which led to the greatest flowering of creativity. It went to a state of compulsion. What creativity has come out of Kashmir in the last 700 years? Compare that with what we had before. Today, right or wrong, right or wrong, there are 20 universities around the world studying Kashmir. What are they studying? They are studying everything pre-14th century. Because they see something there for good, bad, or evil, they see something of vital importance there. It was a society that believed 
in the common good and it went to a society of predatory behavior. Caste system was one where you have countless examples of social mobility. It went to a system where the caste system is the worst in Kashmir. You may be hearing stories about caste in India, but the subjugation of caste in Kashmir is an untold story. Worst of all, the greatest tragedy of Kashmir is what happened to women. Merge Kashmir, Mother Kashmir was the primal cry of every Kashmiri. She was feminine. She represented Shakti. And how over time women were systematically excluded. First from the spiritual places, then from the political arena, then from control of their bodies. That's a case history in itself. But worst of all, Kashmir was the center where the highest truths were studied. It was a magnet civilization where people came from all over. Buddha said, you want to understand the nature of reality? Go to Kashmir. Today, there's only falsehood in Kashmir. Systematic decline over the last 700 years. And the proof of the pudding is in the cohort groups. We can also show some physical evidence. Uh, the picture you have is the ruins of a very important uh, uh, temple after yes. Kotarani. Yes. So tell us about this, uh, this temple. What is this called? And Post Kashmir, one of the great tragedies that you see is the destruction of the temples, which everyone who came to Kashmir said in terms of architecture, in terms of grandeur, it, you couldn't find them even in Greece or Rome. And starting with Sikandar Butchika, all the way these temples were destroyed. And some of these temples burned for six months or a year. Very few Indians know that one of the greatest universities of medieval India was Sharda Peeth University, uh, Takshila, and other universities were Buddhist universities. But Hindu university was Sharda Peeth. That's where Sharda script was developed. By the way, Gurmukhi, 40% of Gurmukhi is Sharda script. Most of our sacred Sanskrit texts are written in Sharda. You want to understand Indian civilization? The road to in understanding Indian civilization is through Kashmir, through Sharda. Sharda, Pete, today is sitting in Pakistan occupied Kashmir in Neelam Valley. So what has happened is a civilization that produced countless heroes today is sending its young, its youth to becoming anti-heroes. So uh, here is this picture of uh, what we call Gulmarg. Yes. So this Gul Marg, Gul being a Muslim kind of an uh, Iranian term, Persian yeah, it's term, flower, flower rose, yeah, uh, their term uh, was Gauri Marg. Absolutely. So when when a supremacist ideology entered Kashmir, it had its mindset to destroy all symbols of what existed before. And I talked about the temples. Let me now talk about. And we all know that the texts were all thrown into the Dal Lake. But let me talk about something as fundamental as names of places. So, uh, uh, Gulmarg, you know, many tourists say, oh, I went to Gulmarg. Well, you didn't go to Gulmarg. The place was Gauri Marg. It was Parvati's meadow, a beautiful name. And it got renamed in the time of Yusuf Chak, one of the immigrants who's clan eventually ruled Kashmir. And you know, you can just keep going on, Shankaracharya being renamed as Temple of Suleiman. So along. is this still going on, renaming? It is going on to this day. Uh, you'll hear, you know, Pir Panchal Mountains. Well, it's not Pir Panchal, there was no Pir there. Sir Oral Stein, one of the Western Indologists, very clearly documented it was Devi Panchala. So, so in is, modern times, in the Farooq Abdullah administration, 
uh, several hundred thousand villages were given Islamic names. So this should be considered a crime. There should be public uh, interest litigation. Uh, you are wiping out cultural memory. You are wiping by renaming. Today, renaming Hindu villages into Islamization, Islamization of Hindu villages by renaming their, them and uh, changing their history, uh, there should be laws against it. Because this is it's the, it's the emotional and intellectual equivalent of destroying temples, destroying architecture. The fact that it still goes on and nobody does anything about it is pretty tragic. But aren't there Kashmir groups, scholars who are raising issues on, with this issue? Look, I think uh, we can talk about uh, Kashmir and the abject failure of the Indian state in general. Uh, but one thing is for sure, uh, truth is a casualty of Kashmir and uh, uh, on all fronts, on all fronts. Most recently, uh, when a group of Kashmiri pundits led by an activist, Sushil Pandit, uh, filed a lawsuit in the Supreme Court asking that uh, the case of genocide, uh, all of the crimes that were committed on Kashmiri Pandits uh, on January 1990 uh, and then thereafter, uh, that those cases be uh, examined uh, and because the killers are still walking freely in the Valley of Kashmir. Uh, astoundingly, the Supreme Court of India, which is planning to reopen the case against the Sikh pogrom in 1984, denied that application on the plea that it would be difficult to collect evidence on those matters. So whitewashing uh, the genocide of the Kashmiri Pandits in modern day India. Isn't this the place where old records were kept? Yes. And this is a place where old uh, generation generation records were kept. And in the following uh, uh, picture, uh, Nehru goes to look for his records. And uh, then uh, Indira Gandhi's uh, remains were buried there, uh, were deposited there, some of his her ashes. Kashmir has represented an interesting battle between the nihilist ideology, which seeks to destroy everything, and the indigenous uh, civilization where memory was very important. And one of the ways that this memory was manifested was before there was Ancestry.com, before there was Genie.com, you had the priests and uh, the top temple in the town of Mutton was a very prominent place where every family had a family priest and whenever there was a major life event, you would go there and you would register there. You would register births, deaths, and they had these historical records that would go way, way, way back in history. And so this photograph that you are seeing is of Prime Minister Nehru going there and making the entry of his family and the new people. But what's there. relevant is that they have destroyed this. Yeah, all of those records are destroyed. Uh, they're priests now without any living have been scattered. It's basically the complete, com look, you know, it's amazing when the Bamiyan Buddha gets destroyed, it gets attention from around the world. When the treasures of Iraq get destroyed, it gets attention of the world. But the tragedy is that in India, you have systemic destruction that is taking place under your nose. And these are crimes against humanity. Under the Indian government and Indian state, it's happening systematically day in, day out. And this picture is from your childhood temple. You, you mentioned, so I should put this up. This is a temple you used to go and pray. But yes. what happened to it now? This is an early picture, but what, what's the situation? So, now? so you know, I, uh, I mean, it's very sad. I, my family comes from a town uh, in Srinagar called Ranavari, where many Hindus live peacefully. Uh, this is the Shiva temple and uh, everybody would assemble there and one of the great things about this temple was that the pundits got together and created a school for girls because we always believed in educating the women called Vishwa Bharti which now is doing very very well uh, over time even the Muslim girls came there because uh, Kashmiri pundits have always had a very open value system well this temple was destroyed it was shattered uh, the murti was thrown away and uh, then eventually, slowly, the Dharma Trust came and 
uh, rebuilt the temple. But you can see what a beautiful place uh, it is, but there's nobody there because all of the people are either in refugee camps in Jammu or they've been scattered around the world. But you can see in that little image the beauty, the peace of what the civilization once was. And this picture is the dilapidated Kashmir today, broken down compared to how things were in your childhood. Yeah, look, I think there are two Kashmirs today. Uh, there is the Kashmir that the majority have funded by the Indian taxpayer, and there is the Kashmir for us pundits, uh, which is basically uh, our land, our property, our assets have been stripped away from us. Uh, it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It's a tragedy of gargantuan proportions. Uh, it's a warning, ultimately. I remember meeting a very prominent leader of India. I don't want to mention his name, but let's just say within the top three. And he told me, he put his hand on his heart. He said, call Sahab. Kashmiri Pandits are the litmus test of the idea of India. Let me just say, when I see what has happened to the Kashmiri Pandits, it is a frightening warning as to the idea of India. And we are beginning to see that now in Kerala and Bengal and other places. So, we have to understand the phenomena of what happened in Kashmir. There's a complete case history. This is the first book that actually presents the notion of the long war. And I was pleasantly surprised that General Petraeus actually said that the conflict that America is in, in Afghanistan and places like that, has to be viewed in the notion of an intergenerational war. This is the first book that actually has research and spelt it out in the form of a story. It's a vital read for anybody who's concerned about India. And once the public understands and reads, that's the hope that Kashmiri Pandits have, that there will be momentum for them to regain their homeland. So let's, in closing, I want to ask you, what is this idea of Kashmiriyat that they keep talking about, this Hindu, Muslim, pan, you know, civilizational unity uh, in a very unique Kashmiri way? They keep talking about that. It hasn't materialized. So what do you think of that? Truth. What is truth? Truth is what works. Kashmiriyat has not worked. So that idea right tells you it was a fraudulent concept. This fraudulent concept was created by Sheikh Abdullah, and then a fraudulent hagiography was created going back to two saints, one a Hindu Shavite saint, Lalla, and then another, an Islamic saint called Nandrashi. And a false hagiography was created of Kashmiriyat that was there. The Kashmiri Pandits have never accepted this term. The Kashmiri Muslims have used it as essentially to mask. And the tragedy is that there are people in India, even today, who use this as a mask to basically say, oh, there was intercultural amity in Kashmir. It's a form of al -taqiyya. That's right. It's it to, is al to the al okay, it, it, That's what it is. So, so what is... Uh, so, so you feel that uh, this business of uh, uh, integrated, happy Hindu-Muslim thing has the 700-year-long experiment has failed, obviously. In Look, Kashmir. when you have seven exoduses, seven exoduses, seven times genocide on a community, you have to face up to it and say, what's the root cause? Yeah, but then you see, often we blame it on Pakistan, but I would say the problem happened even before, long before Pakistan. I mean, there's no Pakistan before 70 years ago, but this happened 700 years. So you have to say there's a civilizational, this is a clash of civilizations, this is a conflict of the religious kind. You cannot hide it, cannot ignore it, maybe it's politically incorrect to say it, but the problem has existed long before there was Pakistan. 
that is the single biggest argument I have with my own Kashmiri Pandit activists who will always start with 1947, who will start with Congress, BJP and get trapped in their own knickers. And I say to them, what happened in 1931 when Abdul Qadir agitation resulted in the massacre of Pandits? There was no India then. What happened? And you go back in history. And so there's a saying in Kashmir, which most Kashmiris don't even know any longer, which is you can only see as much forward as you look backward. And when we truncate our own history, the nihilists succeed because then the discourse is on their terms. This is a very important book to really understand what this conflict is all about. And the origins of the conflict. The origins of the conflict. And on a note of optimism, how coexistence can happen, but on terms that are acceptable to us, not terms that are dictated to us. So with that, I want to close and thank you for, for a good educational piece on Indian history, history of uh, Kashmir and so on. Uh, wish you all the best with your book. Uh, tell me, how has the book been received? So, thank you first for having me. Uh, the book has received rave reviews and I'm grateful for that. The, uh, I think the only thing about the book is because I live in America, I'm not able to push it in India, I'm not in the literary circuit. but. It's been very well ranked. Uh, I would say when it comes to writings of Kashmir, it's probably the highest ranked book. If you go to Amazon.India and see that, the reviews are rave reviews. And part of it is, I think, something to do with the literary style, and I want to end on that, the literary style that has been used in this book. This is the first book that has been written in English in the Shantras. Uh, the only two other books that have been written so far in our civilization in the Shantras is Mahabharat and Kalhana's Rajdrangli. Mm -hmm. That's an impossible uh, ras to create a literary composition in. When I wrote it, uh, it was really for myself, and I thought maybe all of five people will read this book. But w what is gratifying is that the reader, without quite knowing what the inner engineering is or the literary principles are, when they have read this book, it has resonated, and it has purified them, and it has empowered them, and they come out of their experience saying, Wow. And when Indrani reacted to it, a very well-read person, that for me was really joyful because that was proof positive that the literary principles that I followed are eternal. Good. And with that, namaste to all of you. We'll be back in a few days with another episode and we'll continue finding good writers only a few of them we'll select and we are not selecting the ones who are already very famous and marketed and all the hype. Uh, we want people who need to be discovered and we want stories and uh, pieces of work, writings that need to become much more well known than they are. That is our value added. So I'm delighted to have hosted you Rakesh and uh, we'll do some more episodes in the future. Thank you very much. Thank and you. Thank you all for watching and I hope you enjoyed reading the book. Thank you.